Thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Gavin Cleesby's. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Our program this evening is very seasonal. Uh, it is a look at the tradition of summer readings. Uh, we are joined by Professor Donna harrington Luker, who will be speaking on her new publication, Books for Idle Hours, 19th Century Publishing and the Rise of Summer Reading. Ms. harrington Luker is a professor in the Department of English and Communications at Sal Virginia University in Newport, Rhode Island. She has an undergraduate degree from Merrimack College and her master's and PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. As a former magazine writer and editor, her research interests include 19th century print culture, women's magazines of any period, and the radical or alternative press. If you have a uh, question, comment, or concern about the program or our general programs, uh, you can contact me or Sarah Bertulli, our public programs coordinator, uh, and the email programs at masshist.org will make it to us, uh, or you can reach us through um, our website. Um, as I mentioned, we are producing all of our programs for free during the COVID-19 period, uh, but of course we are a nonprofit and uh, an independent nonprofit. So if you have the capability and would like to support the Massachusetts Historical Society, we would encourage you to do so, uh, and you can do that by visiting masshist.org slash support. Uh, I am going to introduce our speaker. This uh, Today we'll be hearing from uh, Donna harrington Luker. And Donna, if you'd like to turn on your uh, camera and unmute yourself, we will be off to the races. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to Gavin and to Sarah for making this possible. Um, now, before we begin, I, I want to acknowledge uh, these are such difficult times with so much at stake and so much of import on our minds. And as I've worked on this um, uh, uh, lecture, this presentation, in the last week, I must admit, I did find myself thinking, is this really the time to be talking about summer reading and summer leisure or even about 19th century publishing? But the last quarter of the 19th century, the period that I focus on in my study, it wasn't without its challenges. At the beginning of the period in 1877, federal troops were sent in to quell a worker's strike, very bloody worker's strike against the railroads. And at the end, the United States found itself in the Spanish-American War. Uh, in between, the country struggled with a failure of reconstruction and a period of rapid industrialization. So the period was not without economic, social, and political upheaval. So with those challenges in mind, um, I'd like to invoke perhaps one of the most prominent um, arguments of the period in favor of summer leisure, and I would extend that to summer reading. And that is that a short period of time away from the pressures of 19th century life, they gave people the wherewithal to engage with the world once again on their return. And I hope tonight's talk might work in the same way for you. So um, let's just jump in. Um, oops. Okay, now a talk about the rise of summer reading and could really begin anywhere in the 19th century. Um, but I'd like to start today's talk in Boston or more specifically in Dorchester with Alice Stone Blackwell, uh, the daughter of Lucy Stone and Henry Brown Blackwell, Blackwell, the prominent uh, 19th century abolitionists and women's rights advocates. Uh, and you can see a kind of a family portrait, a family photo over here on the left um, of the three of them. In the early 1870s, Alice was a teenager and she was a voracious reader, especially in the summertime uh, when her reading turned very, very dramatically to stories of adventure and sensation. So if you read her summer journals of this period, her journals are filled with entries with accounts of rushing into Boston by train or streetcar to pick up the latest issue of Robert Bonner's popular ledger, the popular weekly story paper. Um, or she talks about stopping at the Boston Public Library or the Boston Athenaeum for stacks of books that she devours one week and then returns the next. Uh, a quote here from her journals, quote, changed my books and got out in time for dinner, she writes in July 1872. I've got a very good set of books this time, though I've read them all before. And among the titles that she mentions in this journal, she mentions a gothic mystery called The Thief in the Night, which she admits readily upset her nerves. 
Uh, and also Thomas Hughes's Tom Brown at Oxford, uh, which he describes as a favorite. But Alice took part in a far different kind of summer reading as well. And that's where the picture on the right is going to come in. Um, this is the family's home on Pope's Hill in Dorchester. Throughout the summer, the Stone Blackwell uh, household engaged in shared family reading. Now, this was a very common practice in the 19th century. Um, but in the summer, they did so on the widow's walk. You can see it there high atop the family's Dorchester home to take advantage of the cool breezes from the nearby bay. And there Alice reports the family read books like Sir Walter Scott's The, Sir Walter Scott's the Antiquary and Thackeray's Vanity Fair. That is, they read long novels whose plots would spool out over the course of many a summer evening. And her delight in this shared reading was absolutely apparent. Here's another quote from her journal. The antiquary was read upon the roof, she wrote in July, 1872. And I chased Papa about to tickle his toes. Unrestrained, informal, given to action and adventure, um, Alice's summer reading choices and her reading practices, I think still resonate with us today. Every year we're familiar with this. Every year sometime around the Memorial Day weekend, the summer reading season begins. Oprah makes her picks for the best summer reads, but so does the New York Times, National Public Radio, the Wall Street Journal, and a host of other media outlets. Summer is the time when we're advised to turn to lightweight paperbacks that we can stuff into a beach bag or read without worry by the poolside. It's the time we're told to reach for the light popular novel or the action-packed bestseller. Uh, as Clive Clive Barnes, a critic for the New York Times wrote in the paper's summer book issue for 1968, he said summer reading like the Statue of Liberty and motherhood is always with us. And that's still true today. The list of best summer reads continues uh, in this very, very fraught season. Um, I've just taken some screen grabs. Uh, the first one, two, three of them came from the weekend, um, uh, the Memorial Day weekend itself. Uh, and the one on the bottom, uh, it was just from today. So we see here, the top one is from the New York Times. The beach may be closed, but these books are worth opening. The next one down, uh, Refinery29, a, a site for millennial young women. Uh, the 25 books you'll want to read this summer. On the left is from Oprah, 28 of the best beach reads of the summer 2020. Uh, and then yet another list. Uh, this one came from today's, this afternoon's Boston Globe Online, um, the best books to read this summer. And I might note here about the Boston Globe, I had a chance to kind of go quickly through it and see what they were recommending. Um, and I was really struck. Um, uh, at one point, the New York Times was criticized for its book list that included primarily white authors. Uh, uh, one season, they were accused of having reached peak caucasity uh, with their choices. And these best books to read this summer in the uh, Boston Globe um, are incredibly varied and diverse. Okay, but where did this idea of summer reading come from? Um, uh, summer reading as a specific practice, how did it come to be an established part, not only of literary commerce, but of American culture as well? And those are some of the questions that I began to explore. So I'm a book historian, and so I practice in a field that looks at the intersection of authorship, reading, and publishing. Book history is a field that concerns itself with the book as a material object uh, first, um, but also with the cultural practices that surround books, how books are produced, how they're circulated, how they're received. And one summer, one June, I was returning from a print culture conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I was in the airport bookstore looking for something to read on the flight home, and I came across the ubiquitous glossy brochure that was announcing the best summer reads for that season. Uh, and I found myself, as a result, kind of thinking about my own summer reading rituals and the ways in which the publishing industry may have shaped and sustained those. 
So that led me to the John Hay Library at Brown University, where I worked with a magazine called The Book Buyer. It's a magazine from Charles Scribner, the storied New York City publisher. I'll talk about it a little bit later um, in this talk as well. It's a very rich text full of advertisements from other publishers, copy about what the book trade was like, what people were reading. And from there, I moved on and I moved outward to 19th, other 19th century magazines and newspapers from across the United States. I didn't want to leave this just in New England. Um, I included the African American press of the period, as well as a number of alternative presses. After that, it was on to publishing archives at Harvard and Princeton and Columbia, on to letters and journals, and to a long, long list of novels set at summer resorts. Uh, many of them written by some of the period's absolutely most famous authors. Stephen Crane, William Dean Howells, Louisa May Alcott, Sarah Ann Jewett. They all practiced in the tradition of the summer novel at some point in their career. So what I found as a result of this, um, uh, my summers were now not so idle. Uh, so what I found was a very interesting chapter in the history of publishing. Summer reading, to be sure, in the 19th century was very much a commercial construction. The idea of summer reading as a product was part of the publishing's in, publishing industry's really concerted efforts to redefine a slow season and to capitalize on a really dramatic rise of travel, tourism, and summer leisure in Victorian America and the Gilded Age. But 19th century summer reading involved more than commerce at well. In the last quarter of the 19th century, it also became a well-established cultural practice, a performance, um, and many of those characteristics remain with us today. Overall, then, an interesting chapter, both in the history of the book and the history of summer leisure. Now, my book itself covers a lot of ground. I've just briefly reproduced the table of contents here to give you just a little bit of a flavor of, of the larger argument as well. I look at the dramatic rise of travel, tourism, and summer leisure in the period, in the period where it's changing from an elite cultural practice to one that is embraced by a middle class that increasingly uses it as a marker of gentility. And I would be remiss in not noting here the professional authors of the period all indulged in summer leisure. I also look at a variety of books that were advertised as best summer reads, and I look especially at the development of what I call the American summer novel, the novel that was specifically set at a summer resort. And finally, I looked at the ways in which authorship intersected with and kind of exploited this new genre and at the ways in which physical spaces shape summer reading practices. I looked at everything from resort libraries at Poland Spring and Saratoga Springs to rattan chairs that were advertised for porch side reading that had built in, had bookshelves that were built into uh, the very, very wide arms. Today though, I wanna focus on one part of the book's argument. And that is the role of the 19th century mag that the role that 19th century magazine culture played uh, in reframing summer reading into a genteel practice. Uh, I'm especially interested in the so-called tastemaking publications, um, and I've reproduced some covers um, of these here. These are the three most prominent: the Atlantic Monthly, uh, which was published in Boston, Harper's New Monthly magazine, Arrival in New York City and the Century Illustrated Monthly. Now, their role is going to be very significant. These were publications that had a significant degree of cultural authority. Um, Ellery Sedgwick has described the Atlantic, for example, as an exemplar of Yankee humanism in the kind of copy that it um, uh, featured. And in this age of the magazine, these publications and others um, become the primary vehicle for what Jane Tompkins calls the machinery of publishing and reviewing. That is the machinery that presents a book to readers in a certain way, that frames the text, that establishes a context for it, that prepares us as readers to read it in a certain way and with a certain framework in mind. So together, these and other publications, these and other magazines of this period shaped a discourse on summer reading through their text and visuals, and that's what I'd like to explore. 
Um, let me just say, uh, give you an idea of where I want to go with this as we move ahead. It's kind of in three parts. Um, I want to look at early in the century, um, the very beginnings of a uh, discourse on summer reading. I then want to move on to the complete disruption of cheap fiction that develops in the period. And finally, I want to look at the publisher's efforts to reframe uh, and reclaim summer reading um, as something that was not sinful. We'll see how that develops. Okay, so um, the first part, the very early discourse on summer reading. Let's just go back a bit. Um, and I have some images here, paintings from the period. Um, Taking its lead from England and Europe, um, domestic tourism in the United States uh, developed in the late 1700s around places like Niagara Falls, seen here at the top, the Hudson River, uh, the Catskills over here on the left, um, uh, and um, uh, tourism develops around there. Uh, by the 1820s and 1830s, Wealthy travelers were visiting the White Mountains. You can see that the bottom image on the right is Winslow Homer's painting of um, horseback riding uh, up the side of Mount Washington. Um, they were in Mount Desert Island in Maine, Mineral Springs in the South, and a host of other sites. Excuse me, it's allergy season if you can bear with me. Uh, Newport, Rhode Island begins taking shape here um, as a respite for the heat in the summer. Now, um, uh, I want to look at two magazines here to give you the tenor of how the discourse begins. Uh, on the left, 1835, New England Magazine. Um, you can see here the opening story is Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown. Uh, 1835, though, the New England Magazine read an article called Summer Philosophy. Um, and it began by invoking the political uh, philosopher Edmund Burke um, and his advice to live pleasant. That's the theme of this article. Uh, summer philosophy advised younger and less experienced travelers um, uh, with ways to use their time. And it advised that it ne they needed to use their time to cultivate equanimity. Uh, here's a quote. Walk slow, talk slow, think slow, feed, read, write, dress, undress, in short, live with studied and exquisite deliberation. And that deliberation uh, it needed to extend to whatever reading matter the traveler chose. The summer travel for, traveler, for example, was advised to avoid reading anything having to do with politics, as well as anything that smacked of twaddle and egotism. The best authors the article advised were Lord Byron and Charles Lamb, especially Lamb's essays. Um, here's another quote. Um, uh, the reviewer wrote, quote, tis, uh, Lamb's essays were, quote, tis soda, tis a glass of hawk, tis a customary after dinner nap with visions in the garden, tis a dewy jessamine, uh, jasmine, um, and chat with good girls under it. The young man who follows this advice, and the article is very, very specific about the gender of the summer reader, would cultivate a sweet and imperturbable serenity that was going to last until October. Putnam's over here on the right. Um, Putnam's in the 1850s, it adopted a, sim a similarly dignified approach. In 1853, Putnam's uh, ran a review of a new poetry collection called Falada, a book for the seaside from the Boston firm of Tickner and Fields. It was a collection of poetry about the sea featuring the works of Shelley, Tennyson, Longfellow, and others. And Putnam's was very, very keen on it and said it was going to be not just a good summer read, but a collection of permanent value. Later in the 1850s, Putnam's would also recommend the work of Washington Irving for summer reading. And it would describe Erd Irving, who just happened to be one of Putnam's authors, as a, quote, genial and beautiful genius. Um, it also noted that uh, Irving's works were part of a convenient and pretty railway classics series that would be, quote, delightful for summer reading. So here's our kind of first look, our first glimpse of uh, a discourse taking shape. It frames it as masculine. It frames it as deliberate. It flame, frames it as uh, very, very distinctive um, uh, uh, in what it was designed to accomplish. 
by mid-century that changed, that discourse is gone. Um, uh, the discourse changes and it does so in large part uh, because of a really interesting development in the literary field. Uh, and that is a way, the wave of cheap paperback fiction that flooded the literary marketplace after the Civil War. This was really an absolutely unprecedented expansion of Victorian Americans' popular culture and a significant challenge to mainstream publishers. Now, that challenge took a variety of forms, um, and I'll go here to a uh, wave of cheap fiction. Um, first, um, in this period, this was before the passage of the International Copyright Act, um, this wave of cheap fiction um, included print pirated editions of British and European fiction. So George Eliot's Middlemarch, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, Sir Walter Scott's The Talisman, Charles Dickens, Wilkie Collins, all of these work were not protected by copyright um, and pirate publishing is in the United States, quickly picked them up and published them in very, very cheap paper covered editions often in libraries, sometimes multiple, releasing a volume multiple times a week at a cost of about 10 to 20 cents a volume. Now, readers probably wouldn't find these in bookstores, these cheap paperbacks. Instead, they'd find them at newsstands, railway kiosks, and even on board trains. Boys would go up and down selling snacks, but also paper-bound books. Uh, book historian John Tebble, for example, remarks that by the 1870s, virtually everyone who took a train for a journey of any length at all would have encountered a book from one of the popular uh, cheap libraries. Cheap fiction took another form as well um, in stories from the so-called fiction factories. Uh, these were stories that were quickly produced of questionable quality. They were long on murders and rescue and melodrama very, very heavily formulaic, a real industrial commodity that flooded the market. Now, one other part of this mix of uh, cheap fiction needs to be mentioned, and that is the questionable and perceived to be very immoral French novel, um, typically appearing in yellow paper covers. People talk about this throughout the period and decried by one of the period's critics as not just being sinful, but being scrofulous. So um, all of these are in the mix and you can kind of see three of the covers that will give you the flavor um, of this wave of cheap fiction. Um, so on the left, Seth Jones or Captives of the Frontier from Beadle and Company. Western stories were incredibly popular. They did a lot in the way of nation building. Um, in the middle, Lovell's Library with Thackeray's Barry Lyndon. Um, uh, Lovell was particularly aggressive about the absence of a copyright. And then on the right, one of the most popular writers of the period, Laura Jean Libby, prolific, wildly popular author of working girl fiction um, in paper covers. Now, what's the relationship with summer reading? Light summer reading becomes kind of part of, associated with this um, wave of cheap fiction. And indeed, a number of publishers in the period tried to exploit that connection. Uh, they wanted to take advantage of it. So here was one of them, George Monroe, a New York publisher, uh, and he had an incredibly successful series called the Seaside Library. Uh, and you see over on the left, this would have been the typical Seaside Library cover. It's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, so clearly pirated. Uh, it does say pocket edition. Uh, portability is going to become incredibly important in terms of marketing summer fiction at this time. The idea you could slip it into a pocket or into a satchel. In the middle, you see um, uh, George Monroe packaging that uh, cheap paperback a little bit differently, very, very decidedly for the summer market. Uh, so we have the Seaside Library Pocket Edition, again, uh, King Solomon's Wives by Hyder Ragged. Uh, but then we have that uh, postcard with the lighthouse, with the couple on the cliff overlooking the sea and a sailboat is going by, clearly evoking summer and summertime. And then finally, over here on the right, this is one of my favorite cheap paperbacks and it illustrates kind of another way uh, that they figured um, in this marketplace. Uh, again, it's Laura Jean Libby uh, and it's called Flirtations of a Beauty. 
Um, Laura Jean Libby, as I said, wildly popular. Three of her novels were set specifically at summer resorts. There's one at Lenox, there's one at Atlantic City, and this one, Flirtations of Beauty, um, is um, uh, set initially, the story starts, in Newport, Rhode Island. Now, Libby's plots were really quite wild and incredibly predictable in their unpredictability. Um, uh, the plot here is the typical, a penniless young woman falls in love with a very, very rich man at Newport. She knows that it won't work out because of the discrepancy. And here she is shown sacrificing herself by throwing herself off the wharf. I like to think if you're familiar with Newport, I kind of like to think that this is Long Wharf, but I have no reason for doing so. But here she is throwing herself off the wharf, um, and the little cut line under it says, I am going into the bitterness of death. I'm going to set you free. Um, well, this is early in the novel, and she doesn't die. Um, and in fact, um, as the story progresses, she ends up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, where she's kidnapped by pirates and taken down the Connecticut River in very Libby fashion. Um, uh, this is all in about the first 60 to 70 pages. Now, more worrisome, perhaps for any publisher interested in jump-starting the summer season, was a cultural conversation around this kind of light reading and more. In 1876, the Reverend T. DeWitt Talmadge, a very prominent Brooklyn preacher, launched the summer season with a sermon basically condemning summer life at Saratoga Springs. He criticized its dancing, the gossip, the horse racing, and all the other frivolities that he associated with Saratoga Springs. But he leveled some of his severest criticism against summer reading itself. In fact, he called summer reading literary poison in August, and he warned that the kinds of light novels that people read in the summer were dangers to his congregation's immortal souls. So here we have him, um, uh, two quotes from his sermon. And this would get repeated in the Brooklyn uh, Eagle with some regularity. Do not let the frogs and the lice of a corrupt printing press jump and crawl into your Saratoga trunk or White Mountain valise. Would it not be an awful thing for you to be struck by lightning someday? When you had in your hand one of these paper covered romances, the hero a Parisian roué, the heroine an unprincipled flirt, chapters in the book that you would not read to your children at the rate of $100 a line. I really believe there is more pestiferous trash read among the intelligent classes in July and August than all the other 10 months of the year. Uh, nor was Talmadge alone. Uh, throughout the 19th century, criticism of the novel in general and cheap paperback fiction in particular was rampant. 19th century clerics and cultural critics just about invariably equated uh, novel reading with physical moral debasement, especially for the woman reader. So um, uh, given this kind of cultural cross current, the period between 1870 and 1900 wasn't the most congenial setting for the birth of light summer reading, but mainstream publishers persisted. And they used a variety of tactics. So they're going to reclaim summer reading from this wave of cheap fiction. Um, they used a variety of tactics. For example, first, um, in their advertising, they begin to put labels on everything, the best summer reads, um, even if the books had absolutely nothing to do with the summer. Uh, they used another strategy of packaging books as part of a summer series, kind of making them each a recognizable summer brand. So Appleton had its Town and Country Library. Cassell's had its Sunshine series. Henry Holt, its Leisure Hour series. There was a Satchel series, a Saunterer series, and in the case of one newspaper, a 100 Degree in the Shade summer fiction series. They also embraced the paperback um, as the perfect summer read. Um, here's a quote from the American bookmaker um, in praise of um, the paper covers. These are the golden days of the paper cover, the limp leather, the flexible cloth, the pocketbook. Being without covers, they have a cool and summery look. And from their flexibility, may be readily stowed away in one's pocket or thrust into an unfilled corner of a traveling bag. They adapt themselves to every conceivable reading attitude, 
from the bolt upright to the recumbent position assumed on a sofa or lounge or in a steamer chair, hammock or bed or stretched out on greenswood or sandy beach. I think perhaps most important, taking aim at the cultural discourse that equated novel reading with the sensational and the sinful, publishers work very, very specifically to reframe and repackage light summer reading, framing it as a genteel act, a welcome escape, an essential middle-class pressure. Uh, the taste-making monthlies that I mentioned earlier, Harper's, The Atlantic, The Century, Arbiters of Good Taste and Breeding, they all helped with this. And when you read issues in this period, you find that in their pages, summer novels begin to be described as a way to fill up the vacant hours at a resort or to protect against the boredom of rainy days. They were saying that summer novels didn't demand too much attention, um, but that made them excellent company on long rides in Pullman cars. Summer novels were episodic in structure, but that just meant that the best summer novels could be picked up and put down without losing the thread as other activities beckoned. Most importantly, I think light and easy to read, summer novels were an escape from the pressures of 19th century life. One of the most poignant examples I came across came from the Overland Monthly, a literary monthly in San Francisco. And one season, the critic noted that it was an especially light, lightweight um, selection of summer fiction that was available that year. And he was almost inclined, he or she was almost inclined to criticize, but then they stopped and they said, it had been an incredibly difficult cholera season that year. And they postulate that people needed something to take their minds away from that. Um, most important, publishers, authors, and the literary press together work very, very specifically to reframe summer reading as a gracious feminine pastime. Henry James kind of starts this out. There's an incredibly young um, Henry James. Uh, in the 1870s, like many authors in this period who were just starting out, wanted to get uh, become part of a literary marketplace, um, they began with travel writing, and James is no exception here. Um, in 1870, he wrote a travel uh, column uh, for the nation. Uh, and uh, in a dispatch written from Saratoga Springs, he observed, for example, that there are, quote, few prettier sights than a charmingly dressed woman, gracefully established in some shady spot with a piece of needlework or a book at hand. Or this quote, um, uh, later in the piece, he is recounting a trip on a steamer crossing Lake George to Burlington, Vermont. And he goes on at length about the scenery around him, but then he drills down and he focuses on the young women who are on uh, the steamboat that he is on, on the steamer. And he reports um, uh, that they're standing in a group on the deck with copies of Lothair, um, uh, Benjamin Disraeli's latest novel, which had just been published that year by Appleton's. And they all had it um, in their hands. Um, and so we see this here. The scenery about the lake um, as a whole, a vast, simple, undisturbed wilderness. Uh, we are almost startled to behold these little makeshifts of civilization. You half wonder at our capital little steamer and at the young ladies from the hotel on the deck with copies of Lothair in their hands. Summer reading is becoming a performance and women are embracing that performance. Another link, very, very clear link in the Literary Monthlies um, that link women and summer reading. Um, this is Charles Dudley Warner uh, and in Harper's he's writing, as certainly as the birds appear comes the crop of summer novels fluttering down the stalls, in procession through the railway cars, littering the drawing room tables, in light covers, ornamental, attractive in colors and fanciful designs, as welcome and grateful as the girls in muslin. Later on in this column, he goes on to say that when you're reading something, summer reading should always come, quote, lightly clad and out of stays. That is, it should always come in a lightweight paperback, a metaphor for release. Okay, let me drill down just a little bit further to, to, to show you how this narrative arc, this discourse really takes shape. And the book buyer is a really, really good site for doing this. 
You can really see this process of reframing at work clearly in Charles Scribner's The Book Buyer. Uh, this publication is very little known today. Um, uh, it was published by Charles Scribner's, one of the leading American publishing companies of the 19th century. Um, and initially it was a house organ, that is it was a magazine designed to feature the firm's own work. Um, and at this time, when it starts, 1867, uh, Scribner's is specializing in ecclesiastical texts, the history of Protestantism, for example. It's specializing in school textbooks and maps. Between 1867 and 1870, the first, 77, the first decade of its run, the book buyer was tepid at best about the prospects of summer publishing. For example, um, every month the book buyer feature a column purportedly written from its London office, and it was called Foreign Literary Intelligence, and you can see that over here uh, on the left. Um, it was the cover column. And this offered insights uh, of the book trade in England and the continent. And in 1868, the column noted that in the face of a scorching summer, driving everyone abroad in search of coolness, that few new books were being brought out. That was going to have to wait until late autumn for any kind of new offerings from the publishing world. A year later, the column noted that London was in the middle of a heated term that left people sweltering in broadcloth and tweeds, that's his language, not mine, and thereby stymieing the sale of books. Let me read you just a little bit from this August 1869 column. Um, the papers say that the thermometer in the volunteer camp at, Windle at Wimbledon on Friday last um, at 130 degrees in the shade. And though this seems to be an exaggeration, the heat has been so intense that books have become a weary weariness to the flesh. And the issues of the publishers drop off gradually until they nearly cease altogether during the months of August and September, or what is called the long vacation, where everybody that is anybody but takes himself away from town. In short, people were just too busy in the summer with their Baydeckers and their Murrays, their travel guidebooks, um, to have any time for reading. Okay. Gradually, though, um, uh, in later years, beginning in the 1880s especially, um, uh, gradually the book buyer begins to explore the market for the potential for summer titles in the United States. Here's an advertisement from 1872. This is fairly early. Um, it's the first advertisement that Scribner specifically labels as summer reading. Summer reading, popular books from Scribner, Armstrong, and company. Uh, and it may be kind of difficult to see here, um, but basically this is kind of the grab bag approach to summer reading. It's a real grab bag of titles that it happens to have on hand. It leads in the upper left-hand side uh, with the Erkman Chatrian. These were French authors of very, very popular historical fiction, and they had a new book out, A Miller's Story of the War. But also underneath it, <clears throat> there's something called Common Sense in the Household by Marion Harland. Um, she was a bit of a Martha Stewart of her age, and she was a phenomenally popular author for Scribner's, author of domestic advice books. And then over on the right, we have Shooting, Boating, and Fishing. Uh, so a very kind of utilitarian link with the summer season. Now, that grab bag uh, strategy, marketing strategy, gets refined a bit. And we see Scribner's being very, very, becoming very much more sophisticated. Um, and what follows this is advertisements in 1874 and then again in 1876 for a series called the Bric-a-Brac series. Uh, this was a selection of gossipy literary reminiscences that Scribner positioned quite specifically as a summer offering. And the advertisements of the period, the newspaper promotions and advertisements soon reflected that discourse as well. Um, they begin to describe it as the most pleasant summer reading, aimed to take the tourist at the height of his ennui. They describe it as a refreshing volume, suitable for the country or the seashore, and guaranteed to chase away the fatigue of a long journey in a Pullman car. You can, some of the, you can see some of these in the critical notices over here um, on, the, uh, on my left. Um, from the Christian Union, to all lovers of literary anecdote and of gossip whose whispers are the murmurs of fame, the book will prove a refreshment in many a tired mood. Or the Boston Post, 
No more refreshing volume could be carried into the country or to the seashore to fill in the niches of time which intervene between the pleasures of summer holidays. By the 1880s, the um, discourse continues to develop. The strategy, the marketing strategy continues. And the book buyer really begins a very sustained defense of summer reading. Uh, and it has a much more sophisticated marketing campaign. Um, the book buyer of this period has changed. It's very much less a house organ and it's much more of a literary magazine, a literary monthly. And it is publishing reviews of new books and advertisements from a variety of firms, Appleton, Lippincott, Tickner, Macmillan, and others. Um, and June 1884, the start of the summer season, uh, it does the best summer books um, uh, in paper editions. Um, and then we have this, 1885. This is the first ad for summer books in paper covers. Um, and this is very interesting in terms of the way the advertisement works. If you look closely, you can see the prices. These are paper bound books. They are 50 cents to a low of 30 cents. So not as low as the cheap publishing, but definitely cheaper than the $1.25 cloth cover uh, that the books might have appeared in. Now, the first three are, are books by very, very popular, well-established Scribner authors, many of them from the 1870s, so they're not new at this point. So we have Frank R. Stockton's The Lady or the Tiger, or Rudder Grange, it was a story about a uh, family on a canal boat. Um, uh, it also mentions uh, Francis Hodgson's Burnett's uh, That Lass of Lowry's. It's a story about the coal mines of Lancashire, England. Uh, but Burnett was a very, very popular author. But look at the three titles underneath it. The three in the middle are all by George Parsons Lathrop. One is Newport a Novel. One is something called An Echo of Passion. And the third is In the Distance. All three of these are novels set at summer resorts. So Scribner is beginning to see this potential of capitalizing specifically on summer reading by featuring reading matter that is set, novels, fiction, uh, light fiction that is set at a summer resort. And then at the bottom, we kind of have a miscellany of everything else that they had available. Now, some of the firm's most popular authors had been advocating this for years. Um, over on the left, we have Frances Hodgson Burnett. Uh, her husband, Swan Burnett, lobbied Scribner's repeatedly to issue low-priced editions of his wife's work to compete with T.B. Peterson. Um, all the material for this side came from the Scribner's archives at Princeton, where I had the pleasure of spending a week uh, reading. Um, Swan Burnett wrote saying that he hoped Scribner could recommend a decent firm in New York that might take on the task of issuing his wife's work in cheap paperback editions. And he specifically, if incredibly disingenuously, mentions both George Monroe, which Scribner would have been appalled by, and even the Harch rival Harper's, uh, which had begun its paperback Franklin Square editions for summer reading that year. In the middle, Mary Mapes Dodge. Um, she made a much more obvious pitch for a summer volume. She was the author of, we, we know her, from Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates. She was also editor of Scribner's very, very popular summer children's mag, uh, I'm sorry, very, very popular children's magazine, St. Nicholas. But she had a collection of short stories for the adult market called Theophilus and Others, and Scribner's had published that but she saw her potential for reissuing it for the summer market. And she writes to Scribner's, quote, do you think well of the idea of issuing a very cheap and abridged edition of Theophilus and others in a soft but attractive cover for summer reading? Two years later, she, re she renewed her request for a cheap and thin covered edition, assuring Scribner's, quote, a number of literary friends have suggested that the book would do well as a summer book of this kind. And then finally, my all-time favorite, over here on the right, Mary Virginia Tarun. Um, her pen name was Marion Harland, who I've mentioned before. She's one of the firm's best-selling authors. She's a prolific author, a uh, prolific novelist in her own right, as well as a 19th century domestic diva. And in 1890, she was the editor of a magazine called The Homemaker. She was just a real Scribner celebrity. 
In March in 1890, she wrote to Scribner asking if he'd be interested in her new novel, which was then running serially in the homework homemaker. It hadn't been completed yet. It wouldn't be completed until September. But in March, she's writing to him. The novel was called With the Best Intentions, and it was set at the resort at Mackinac Island, an increasingly popular resort um, in the Great Lakes. And she advised Scribner that it ought to be have a fair summer sale, especially in the West. So she hadn't finished the novel, but Scribner was interested, or at least it was quick to publish the novel. In a little more than four months after her first letter of inquiry, the book was published as part of the Yellow Paper cover series, and Scribner's advertised it heavily in July and August, including it that year among its picks for the best books for idle summer days. Um, a little bit of an aside here, um, uh, uh, Tarun had an entirely commercial uh, motive for making this ask. Um, she admitted to Scribner's, quote, I am building again and want a large sum of ready money. That is, she needed the $600 advance that Scribner was offered. A final chapter in the book buyer's history with summer reading, which I really want to suggest is kind of suggested of the larger publishing industry's discourse on summer reading as well. Um, this is the June 1888 um, issue. Uh, and Scribner's here decided to go head to head with Publishers Weekly, which had been publishing a special summer issue for the trade since the 1870s. But it devoted its entire June 1888 issue exclusively to the summer book market and summer reading. Um, this was something publishers routinely, routinely did for their Christmas promotions, but they hadn't done at this point for the summer. Uh, and you can see here on the cover this very, very definite uh, buildup of the audience for summer reading as the woman reader. So we see on the left a young woman, the white muslin again, uh, holding up her book. She seems to be under some kind of an apple blossom tree, all freshness and solitude, nothing of the heat and dust and crowds of railroad cards that would have been attendant on summer leisure. And that image gets repeated on a full page ad with this familiar formula, an old favorite, a couple backlist titles, a new volume as well. The woman reader becomes the center of the marketing strategy. And the woman reader is going to stay there for the rest of the century. Um, she's going to become a trope that other publishers exploit, making summer reading a markedly female space. So I have some posters here, for example. Um, by the 1890s, um, publishers used art posters like these to publicize new issues of their magazines. So we have a poster for the century, Lippincott's, Harper's, um, all of them featuring the summer reader. Now, to be sure, uh, reservations remained. Some magazines, uh, illustrators of the period, turned a really wry eye to the woman reader and her summer reading practices. And we can see these in the next three images. I'll try to um, uh, go through these. Um, this is a Life magazine cover from July 1883. Um, it features several people in hammocks, um, but the prettiest thing in hammock is the young woman in the center. Um, uh, she is uh, languidly absorbed in a novel titled a burglar's love. Uh, she is alone, wrapped in the hammock. She has a bag of candy. If you look really closely under her elbow, she has a bag of candy at her side. So she becomes a consumer of both words and sweets. Another one, um, July 1886. This is an illustration from Charles Dudley Warner's Their Pilgrimage, um, uh, which was running in Harper's. It's a fictional romp through the period summer resorts. And here is a scene from the installment that takes place at Newport, Rhode Island. And it's called The Shepherd and His Flock by the very well-known illustrator C.S. Reinhardt. Um, and it shows a school teacher's convention at the hotel in Newport. Um, and every one of the young women here is totally absorbed in her paperback book or magazine uh, while the preacher uh, looks on. Um, I don't think that's um, the Reverend T. DeWitt Talmadge there. He seems a little bit more accepting. And then finally, one of my absolute favorite images of the period is from July 1897, and it's Charles Daner Gibson's, it's called Marooned. 
Um, the distinctive Gibson girl is here in her summer dress on the beach. Her body language suggesting the effects of too much leisure, too much sun. Um, and if the boxes and paperbacks at their feet are any sign, they're suffering from too much summer reading. Having consumed the latest novels to arrive by mail, the readers are spent. Um, okay, finally, I think I'm doing okay with time here. Um, since I began with an example from Boston, I'd like to end there as well. This example is very far removed from Alice Stone Blackwell and her copy of A Thief in the Night. It's also an example that complicates this discussion of summer reading by referencing a second tradition that takes shape in the 19th century, um, the counter narrative that summer is a time for serious, sustained and thoughtful reading. So the book I want to end with, and this illustration is taken from that book, um, is called The New Harry and Lucy, A Story of Boston in the Summer of 1891. And it's by Edward Everett Hale and his sister, Lucretia P. Hale. Now the plot is exceedingly familiar to anyone who's familiar with the genre, um, to anyone who has read any of the novels set at a summer resort. Two young people, two young people meet, fall in love in the summertime. The plot moves forward with the characters engaging in a variety of summer activities. In this case, um, they ride the streetcars to Riverside where they rent a canoe. Um, they visit the Mount Auburn Cemetery. They ride the boat to Nahampton back. But the young Lucy of the title takes her summers especially seriously. For her, summer is a time also to visit the Tremont Temple to hear a lecture by Helen Keller. It's a time to teach in a morning vacation school for Boston's at-risk children. It's a time to end a birthday commemoration of Jenny Collins, a suffragist and labor reformer who established a charity home for Boston's poor working women. So summer, in other words, was a time not just for wooing and ferry rides, but for serious engagement with significant social issues. And I found myself wondering as I put this together, that perhaps this will be the tenor of our summer reading today, but it still will be summer reading. So with that, um, I thank you. Um, and I guess I'm going to channel my inner swan Burnett <laughs> by just calling your attention here. Um, uh, this is the cover of my book, Book for Idle Hours, 19th Century Publishing and the Rise for Summer Reading. Um, it is available online from the University of Massachusetts Press. Um, and I've just put the code here for 30% off and free shipping. Um, uh, your support for the press would be greatly appreciated. Um, looks like we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, one was, uh, are there any uh, 19th century summer reads that are still read today? Oh, okay. Um, that's a question that I really grappled um, a, a lot with. Um, they definitely are ephemeral. They definitely are of their time. Not many of them are available today with the possible exception of the works of William Dean Howells, one of the most prominent authors of the period. So his work is, is still there. There was one book called One Summer uh, by an author by the name of Blanche Willis Howard that was incredibly popular. Most of these novels, they were there for one season and then they disappeared. But Blanche Willis Howard's novel was published every year from the 1870s on through to the 1900s and beyond. Um, it took place in Wiscasset, Maine, um, and tells the story of a young woman uh, who was courted by a young man. Uh, it was wildly popular. Um, I found references to it in the Harvard College Library, books donated by Harvard professors. And that would probably come closest, the works of Sarah on Jewett, but I think they are, the books are very much of their time period. The tradition is very, very much a part of ours still today. Thank you, that was a great question. Tamara uh, wrote, uh, thank you, wonderful. Uh, was summer reading recommended as an escape from George Beard's version of uh, American Nervousness or alternately associated with uh, a version uh, of American Nervousness uh, that characterized it as languid debility? 
Um, uh, I think that what they were probably most concerned with was kind of a hypersensitivity. Um, and so this whole period in which they talk about women and women's hysteria. Um, and so they definitely were in conversation. The critics of summer reading were definitely in conversation uh, with those deleterious effects um, of light reading. Um, but for women, I think they were more worried uh, not so much about languor um, as about um, uh, hypersensitivity to um, sexual stimulation by reading sensational novels. We couldn't have that. Great. Um, does summer reading uh, become populist uh, beyond the middle class? Uh, is it marketed to working and non-Caucasian audiences? Um, I was really surprised by the range of audiences um, that it met. Now, I kind of have to tease this out. Um, I found a number of books um, that were contributed to libraries. So uh, a copy of One Summer appears in the Stanford University collection, and it comes specifically from uh, the Stanford family. The book plate says the Stanford family estate. Um, also a copy at Harvard um, that has the indication of a Harvard political professor who has um, donated it. Um, at the same time though, um, I, I looked at, there's a wonderful online site that um, it's called What Muncie Read. Um, and it looked at what was checked out of the library in Muncie, Indiana. Um, and we can kind of trace uh, summer novels there as well. And then kind of a final piece of this, um, they were advertised not just in New England, uh, but in California as well. So novels about Maine and the Maine coast would appear in California. And working people would have been featured in the fiction, uh, but uh, maybe less clear that it went beyond uh, the middle class to the working class, except for Laura Jean. I hope I can call her by her first two names. Um, yes, I did. Uh, do you think this type of reading in literature for women helped to sort of, quote, keep women in their place and reinforced their inferior status in society? Marriage was definitely a major concern. All of the plots had to do with, with marriage. And this would have been a period of time, especially just after the Civil War, um, where you had a proliferation of young single women. So I think you kind of have to say, is it the glass half empty or is it half fill? Um, does it provide it with agency? Um, it does end in marriage for just about everyone. Uh, I can think of one exception and that is William Dean Howell's novel. Um, so I, I guess with that in mind, but the young women are shown in um, dramatically, summer was a period of release. So you have young women in canoes, you have young women going out on chaperone, you have young women climbing trees and climbing mountains. Um, so it's kind of like with that Shakespearean comedy, we have this festive comedy where there's a period of festive relief where women are trying out new roles um, uh, and are given the freedom to do that. Um, but there is that marriage at the end. Um, and whether you see that as containment or fruition, I think the books kind of leave that up in the air. Uh, so yes, I, uh, Donna, this is from Martha. Uh, Donna, a wonderful presentation. In your book, you mentioned that many of the characters in the summer novels were themselves reading summer novels. Can you talk a bit about the intention there? Uh, was it for fun, a wink and a nod, marketing? Um, yeah, um, a number of the novels, uh, the, the, the authors who are writing these are, are kind of very, very aware of what the conventions are. So very often there'll be references to characters seeking out summer reading. In one summer, for example, the two people who eventually will marry, um, they meet because the young woman goes out on a rainy night because she's seen a paperback bestseller in the drugstore that morning and she has to go out in the rain in order to do that. She bumps into the man who will become her husband um, because she has to do that. Um, another young woman is being courted by multiple suitors um, and they have her reading um, uh, in the novel itself. So it's kind of a meta-analysis, if you will, but the authors were very, very aware of kind of what the conventions were, what readers expected. Um, and I don't want to say that they were slavishly following it. Um, I think that in a number of cases, especially for Howells, he's very much kind of exploding some of the conventions um, and showing the ways in which this genre can tell stories that are more complicated um, than simply lightweight. Great. So I want to be conscious of people's time. I think we, we may have time for um, one last question. Um, 
I guess the, the last question could be, um, what happens with summer novels uh, in the 20th century as we turn into the 20th century? You know, I had to stop at some point. Um, uh, and I tended, to, I, I, I stopped in the early 1900s. Um, but I went back through and just kind of looked. It persists. Um, uh, I went back and looked, for example, you know, in times of war, what happens? Um, and so the tradition of kind of putting the label on it, um, this persists. The idea of it being a specific uh, kind of uh, a novel. I think that persists as well, that you can take the Elon Hildebrands and uh, some of the books that are set on Nantucket and other places today that are very, very much designed for a female audience. And you can trace that genre back um, but um, as I say, I, 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 slight, I cited uh, Clive Barnes saying, you know, like, like the Statue of Liberty and Apple Pie, summer reading is always with it. I think it persists clearly as a marketing practice. I'm not sure that it has the force of a cultural practice today as it did back in the 19th century. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. So if you would like uh, to order a copy of the book, um, it is available from UMass Press. Um, and the uh, um, discount code is on the screen here. Um, and thank everyone for joining us. Um, and we hope you enjoyed the program. Uh, and we hope you'll consider uh, continuing to support MHS and uh, joining us for the rest of our programs over the summer uh, while you may be on the beach reading. So uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you.